poetry. The volcano sat like a peaked cap at the head of the island, but this we only knew from photos, since whenever we were near enough to see it, it lay covered in mist and clouds. The clouds suggested rain, and rain su suggested Celeste would not enjoy the hike, but so frankly did Celeste dislike of hikes, in any way I had convinced myself the weather would cooperate. Cooperate is an interesting word in this context because it implies a natural alignment of interests, mine and the volcanoes, and the history of humans and volcanoes, as I understand it, does not encourage much confidence in this direction. But the volcano was there, and so we had to climb it. That was how things shook out for me. Once Celeste had spent the afternoon in a high altitude refuge while I hiked to the top of an Italian mountain in sneakers and shorts among people with poles and crampons who looked outfitted basically for an expedition to Mars. So maybe Celeste did have a choice, but maybe not. There was the question of marriage and children after all and the deeper alignment of interests, tendencies, compulsions, and so on. James needs harrowing ordeals to prove that he's not already on the long downslope to death, I once heard her tell an acquaintance at a dinner party. Death, I said. I'm worried about living. I'm worried about not embracing the trappings of death before the time comes. Celeste looked at me like I'd proved her point, and maybe I had. I've never cared much about death one way or the other, but someday I'll come face to face with it, and then who knows. For now, I'm worried about getting maimed. The first part of the hike proved steep and endless. The slopes of the volcano rose beside us in pleated folds of utter impenetrable green. The verges fell away precipitously in the depthless ravines the creases made, slick and dazzling with their wet emerald sheen. It would have been beautiful if it hadn't been freezing. It still was beautiful, but the rain rose and fell, starting and stopping ceaselessly, as though someone were shaking out a massive sodden towel above us. Somewhere far below, the island lay bathed in sunshine, and wherever you looked, the hypnotic azure of sky and sea would confront you. But up here, a permanence of cloud blotted out the sun and banished the heat in an icy mist. We had been hiking for an hour or two, straight up to judge by the impression you had looking down that you might fall back to where you had begun. The rain rose and water ran over the rock scrambles and wetted stream beds. Celeste slipped on a wet stone, fell on her knee, and scraped the hand she put out to break her fall. Instead of crying out, she inhaled sharply to indicate pain's repression, a greater punishment through stoicism for my conscience. Are you all right, I said. Go on, she said, I'll catch up. Did you hurt yourself? I'm fine, go on. We were not prepared for the hike, it was true. I could see Celeste's thin jacket clinging to her like the memorial drapery on a statue. But what could I say to relieve her misery? Nothing. Short of turning back, which would only ensure that our suffering had been pointless, there was nothing to do, nothing to say. Kafka has remarked that there is hope, but not for us, and if I thought I could, this could draw a smile from Celeste, I would have offered it to her as the gallows humor of preterition, the humor I used to bandage my heart. But I know Celeste, and I know what she finds funny, and I don't relish those distant, unamused eyes. The staircase in the mountain seemed empirically to ascend forever. Had the peak or some other landmark been visible, we might have known how to evaluate our suffering. As things stood, we could only hold to the idea, my idea, that suffering underwrote a deeper pleasure. An hour or two later, by the time we made it to the ridge, we had not passed a single person. The ground leveled off, dipping and rising in knobby hillocks among the bushes and outcroppings of rock. Water pooled in the path, and long wooden planks sank into the mud. We circled the rim until we had gone too far and doubled back. Inscrutable trail signs with apparently arbitrary distances to unknowable, ambiguous destinations gave the impression of order while denying access to it. The path down into the caldera was simply nowhere to be found, and I knew that if I suggested turning back, Celeste would agree. I knew because she hadn't said anything in a half hour. Darling, I said, are you still with me? No answer. Darling, I heard you. More speech was bound to annoy her. I am not insensitive to the tacit signals of hatred and hostility. But sometimes words are a Hail Mary, a desperate heave into the abyss of a new reality. Sometimes I believe words can do this much at least, overturn our mood and our beliefs, shake free the cage of our ideas, 
rewrite the fabric of existence even. Sometimes it seems as simple as telling Celeste to imagine the beach, imagine the heat in the sun, imagine the sun setting over the water, pina coladas in our last night, the light on the bay, dinner, anything she likes. As simple as saying, we are going to head down soon, and when we do, the island will be just as we left it, hot and sunny. We will sweep down from the headland highlands along those narrow inland roads by waterfalls and banana plantations until our anger has evaporated in the heat, until the memory of pain has turned to vapor and we forget everything but the satisfaction of what we have done and its taste, which will be the taste of prune de cythere. Prune de cythere, huh? A smile complicated the resolve of Celeste's annoyance. Yes, I said. Yeah, that was loud. Yes, I said, drinking the fruit's juice while we look up at the volcano will forever yoke the experiences, one a memory, one a taste, in our inner registries, even though we don't know what it is. Especially because we don't know what it is, I said. You will have nothing else to attach to, no footing in the abstract realm of knowledge. A pure experience, summoned but unmediated by the word. Celeste wasn't listening. She was looking at a break in the bushes, barely wider than a girl in profile. The verdure parted here to reveal the hidden passage, tumbling straight down to the crater floor through a vertical window of branches and vines. The going was steep. I slipped on a wet ladder, landing hard on my ribs, but didn't say anything. We made our way slowly from the bottom. We, we made our way slowly. From the bottom, we could see the verdant canyon hung in mist. Everything was very still. The embankments rose like the prolate rock formations in Chinese scroll paintings, massive looming shapes half lost to fog. The air was damp but warmer for the stillness. Short, stocky trees with thick mossy middles and flared canopies rose from the lush greenery, holdover surely from the Jurassic. Flecks of orange and red stippled the knotted green pile, so dense and soft it seemed you might fall into it like feathers or snow. Broad fronds with fans the size of bath mats grew off low stalks. Berries hung in bead curtain arrangements like bunched rosaries, and glossy persimmon structures resemble, resembling bulbous pine cones made upturned pouches catching the water. All of it was alien, a garden, a flora, unlike anything we had seen. Looking closer, we found strange pink and purple organs under the leaves. What were these? We didn't know. We might have spoken, but everything was so quiet, so still so dense and thick with mist. The unreality of strange beauty, beauty, the inarticulacy of this or any miracle silenced us. I had just received another message from Jacqueline, her third that day. After returning from the volcano, we had set up at the beach and now sat back in the shade of some squat trees whose fruit littered the sand around us. To the east, the white sand cove swung out in a crescent, becoming a spit of raised land where, a ways off, you could see people walking along a ridge. Jacqueline was renting us her downstairs apartment. She was a French woman in her early middle age, pretty with a healthy athletic figure and the air of a high school cheerleader weighed down by adult worries. She lived in the house with her enormous teenage son, Hugo, and a mysterious boyfriend we had never seen. Hugo had been waiting for us in the middle of the road on the day we arrived, possibly for hours since we got in rather late. He had been staring out to sea with a blank look, as if at an indistinct point in the distance he could see the end of some captivity he was enduring. Jacqueline's messages often required a sophisticated hermeneutics. You are not too cold or buggy at nights? I have screams. Also, I did not mention before, I am a poet. <laughs> Presumably, she meant screens. I showed the message to Celeste, who said, Oh, good Lord. I don't know what had possessed Jacqueline to reveal herself suddenly as a poet, but I feared, it seemed altogether likely, that in a moment of extravagant miscalculation, she had imagined an episode in which we undertook a literary conversation. The thought was horrifying. <laughs> Celeste was too busy with her own messages to give me what I wanted, which was to make fun of Jacqueline's shy admission until its poignancy and earnestness stopped afflicting my heart. Hmm. Celeste had work emails flooding in. Her assistant had taken the entire fall off with a mysterious, even suspect, leg injury, and now emailed Celeste 15 times a day, demanding in peremptory and vaguely hostile tones that Celeste fill out paperwork. Someone's phone chimed. Celeste didn't move, so it must have been mine. Down the beach, I watched a man stumble to his feet. 
The man was tall and thin, with dark hair on his head and chest and a virile mustache. It took me a moment to realize what I was seeing, that he only had one leg, and his stumbling, awkward grace was the attempt to get up using a single metal crutch. Was that your phone, Celeste said? We are strangely more concerned about checking phones when it's the other person's. Although the light reflecting off the water and bright buff sand dazzled my vision, I could see it clearly now. Only one leg emerged from the man's black swim trunks. I watched him hop to gain his balance and idly picked up one of the small yellow-green fruit from the sand. Well, said Celeste, what says the poetess? It was true. I only received messages from Jacqueline. I loved a pomegranate from my heart. Welcome home. <laughs> I stared at my phone, expecting the words to resolve into something other than a dispatch from some lost province of derangement. <laughs> Instead of the word heart, she had used a purple heart emoji. Significant? <laughs> I handed the phone to Celeste. What is this, I demanded. Is this a poem? Celeste frowned at the screen for a while. Then her nose wrinkled, and she began laughing in slow, gathering waves. I think she's saying she left us a pomegranate at the house. I looked again. Yes, it was unmistakable now. In fact, Jacqueline's first words when we arrived, I now remembered, had been, welcome home, which she seemed to have settled on as the distinctive slogan of her hospitality, the way a motel chain advertises under a catchphrase. It was meant to put us at ease, but it had the disconcerting effect of startling everyone with an abrupt intimacy that couldn't be returned. A terrible silence descended, and Hugo stared into the distance with his secret pain and lobotomized expression. A correction message buzzed on my phone. I left. Oh, Jacqueline. I had grown to love Jacqueline, and not just because she was the one reliable correspondent in my life. No, I couldn't abide a conversation with her or anyone really about poetry, but the tenderness I felt was a worm eating my heart. I imagined her lamenting the way this typo had ruined the gesture, just as small mistakes and oversights had derailed so many of her brave intentions over the years. Suddenly, I understood that for her, every experience was the disappointing shadow of something she had allowed herself to imagine ahead of time. The same way her poetry, I had no doubt, was the inadequate and bitter fruit of the purer and more beautiful impulse to write poetry, which survived in violet, no matter how poor and insufficient the words one found were. The fruit in my hand, dimpled like an apple, was the size of a child's fist. I sniffed it and broke the skin with a fingernail to smell the pith. Of course, I didn't know the first thing about Jacqueline, but I knew about myself. Welcome home. I passed the fruit to Celeste. Prune de Cythere, I said. She sniffed it and handed it back. Smells like it. I took a small bite. Tastes like it too, I said. It was sweet. I took a somewhat larger bite and gave it to Celeste. Here, try. Celeste hesitated. She is not in the habit of eating alien fruits. But then she nibbled some too. Across the beach, the man with one leg had been joined by his younger girlfriend, a pale blonde woman with the usual number of limbs. She was helping him down to the water. The movement, jerky and stork-like, drew attention to itself. But I was looking because of something else. It was how sexual they were together. I don't know how else to put it or what this means exactly, except that they were playful with each other as adults really are. It was a performance of a sort. They had established clarity on the point, and such clarity can be important. It is, for instance, important to me at times, when I find myself at dinner with my mother, to announce loudly to the waiter, this is my mother, or an equivalent expression that makes our relationship unambiguous. <laughs> Celeste was still on her phone, so I walked to the water by myself. My thoughts had turned to the couple's sex life. What was under the man's bathing suit, and how had the woman first responded when she saw him naked? with aversion or arousal or something more mixed and subtle, a curiosity and arousal that we're inseparable from, somehow part of the shock or fear that we feel in the presence of difference. It was, of course, possible that the absence of his leg did not enter into it, and that is we are taught to believe, and no one, I think, believes fully the matter of love transcended any and all superficial considerations. But who is to say what is superficial and what isn't? No. More likely, I thought, entering the water and feeling the warm salt liquid envelop me, cooling nothing but seeming to focus the sun's rays more penetratingly on my skin and eyes and lips. More likely, the woman enjoyed the idea of herself as someone who takes an unusual partner, or, for that was only one possibility, 
she understood that we are all incomplete versions of an unafraid self trying to be born, and that our apparent wholeness only blinds us to this more substantial insufficiency. If Celeste had been there with me, I would have remarked that this couple had taken up arms in the fight against death, not because an incomplete body represents death, but because normalcy represents death, because every decision that conforms to expectations, that raises no eyebrows, prompts no outrage or whispering or gossip, that merely reprises the amber templates forged as prisons by those who have come before, every action taken under this regime of fear was the prefatory enactment of death. And Celeste would have said, I see we're back on your favorite subject. And I would have said, I want to talk about death and other big things like life and the soul and tax policy. I want to tromp around in boots in the china shop and where you've laid crystal figurines on the ground and dressed the halls in lace someone went blind to sew. You made your position clear. My position isn't clear to me, I'd shout. My position isn't clear because my position depends on you. Then talk to me and don't speak for me in imaginary dialogues in your head. But you're not here, I said, and watched her tumble into the blackness of my mind, spinning like a falling figure in an old movie. There I go again, speaking for everyone when I'm alone, naming all the animals and plants like my words can turn them into something else. All the salt and sun had left my lips peppery and hot. This was my interpretation of the situation, and for a while it sufficed. At a certain point, however, the peppery sensation had grown acute enough to shake my confidence in this explanation, and I had to go looking for another. Yes, the course of my epidemiological survey was obvious in theory. If Celeste shared my symptoms, we could limit the possible causes to things we had both experienced. If she did not, we could limit it to things I had experienced alone, or possibly a rare allergy on my part. Nonetheless, as we drove back to the apartment, I felt an overpowering diffidence about mentioning the situation to Celeste at all, as if its reality depended in part on whether I put it into words. We passed Hugo on the way, walking by himself on the side of the road toward the beach we had come from, massive and lumbering with that zombie-like look in his eye and the same flip-flops and t-shirt he seemed always to wear. For a moment, the humor and pathos of his figure saved me from my predicament, but then he was gone and my predicament wasn't. I have this burning sensation in my mouth, I said. Oh no, I have it too. Celeste's words came so fast after mine that I could only conclude she had been nursing the same dilemma. She laughed, but it was as if a different emotion had been mistranslated into laughter. Do you think it's that fruit we ate? Must be, I said. I could think of nothing else. I expected Celeste to be angry with me, but she wasn't, and in a way this was worse. It implied that the situation was serious enough that she didn't want to risk our solidarity with a principled or exploratory argument or even that we didn't have time for one. Nonetheless, she took a shower. I took the occasion of her shower to see what the internet had to say about burning mouth sensations and beach fruit. <laughs> I thought it might be difficult to determine exactly what we had eaten, but this wasn't the case. We had eaten the fruit of the mancanil, the world's deadliest tree. <laughs> that was what it said, not most poisonous, deadliest. <laughs> You were not even supposed to sit near the tree or breathe the air around it. Standing under it when it rained would raise blisters on your skin, and if you ate its fruit, as some hapless survivors on the internet had done, you could expect a delayed burning sensation to emerge half an hour or 45 minutes later, followed by increasingly severe symptoms in the throat and bowels. I read, but it did not feel like reading at all. The information seemed to pass directly into me. The fruit was called the little apple of death, <laughs> and its poison had been used to kill Ponce de Leon. <laughs> I couldn't recall who Ponce de Leon was exactly, but I was positive he was harder to kill than me. <laughs> I listened to the sound of Celeste's shower. It was a soothing whoosh, a lovely noise. I thought about how Celeste probably felt, happy and relaxed. I did not feel happy or relaxed myself but a certain calm had drifted in on the coattails of my terror. This was the feeling of time slowing down. It was electric, the word death is applied to something inside me. On the one hand, I believed it, believed everything I had read, and on the other, like a hurricane gathering, like a hurricane gathering in the differential pressures of hot and cold, 
I felt a vertigo arise from the surreal correspondence between the abstraction of information online and the reality of my body. Since the episode with the death apple could so easily have been avoided, it seemed, in a sense, not to have happened at all. But then it had, and the fact of my having acted and its barren consequences grew implausibly strange, above all because the dark light of these consequences came to me entirely through the prism of words. I had an odd intuition. My intuition was that I could rewrite the reality of the situation through an act of will, a refusal to accept what was the case. I could rewrite my death by believing resolutely that I would be fine. I know this belief is called magical thinking, but it did not strike me as remotely magical then. What was magical was that you could type words into a computer and conjure other words that foretold the future of your body. That was crazy. Celeste emerged from the bathroom wrapped in a towel, drying her hair with another towel. The way she dabbed her ears to get the water out shook my resolve. It was so simple and human, so poignantly insufficient to the situation. She seemed incredibly tender and vulnerable before me, and I seemed possessed of a dark knowledge, an insidious virus of despair that I could transmit to her in words. I knew this was an illusion, that Celeste had to deal with the same unpersuadable realities of life and death as anyone else, and that I did her no favors pretending otherwise. But I felt the urge to protect her and save her any pain I could. For a wild second, it even seemed to me that a death presided over by ignorance might be preferable to a life enclasped in this horrific understanding. She noticed the computer on my lap. Did you find anything out? Nothing to worry about, I said, closing the screen and laying it aside. Maybe upset stomachs or something. We're fine. <laughs> what did we eat? A kind of beach plum. <laughs> she sat on the bed and smiled. What a relief. I was starting to worry something was really wrong. No, no, we're fine. My voice sounded hollow and unconvincing, but Celeste seemed not to notice. We're great. <laughs> it was like some terrible newscaster had possessed my faculty of speech when my mind drifted away. We're so great. <laughs> We're going to live forever. <laughs> forever, Celeste smiled. I don't understand. Because we entered the garden of the volcano. Anyone admitted to the garden of the volcano is granted eternal life, didn't you know? I see. You don't sound convinced. Convince me, said Celeste. When the volcano erupted many years ago, this is what I told Celeste, a great number of people perished. Each one of these people, as their body turned to stone, became part of the volcano. They merged with it, and these became the gardeners and tenders of the caldera. Since they had access not only to the materials of the earth, but also to those which lay within the earth in the realm of the dead, they were able to cultivate plants that did not exist anywhere else in the world. And because these plants carried traces and elements of death in them, anyone who breathed the air they scented and in which they released their pollen grew resistant and then immune to death by a Mithridatic process. This presented a problem, of course, of course, said Celeste, because the god of the dead, who was also, incidentally, the god of volcanoes, could not well abide the eradication of death. He chided the souls of the garden, who had come under his jurisdiction, saying, you have created a beautiful garden, everyone admires it, and you have done this for nothing but the love of pruning, tending, and seeing unknown forms spring to life. But this garden has come at a cost. It has upset a necessary balance. And soon, if this continues and nobody dies, people will fill the earth, every last corner of it, and they will ruin your garden too. See, he was clever, I said. He made them see his problem as their problem. Less commentary, said Celeste. Well, the souls howled and keened as distressed souls are known to. What can we do, they moaned, since they knew a garden that nobody visited was not worth tending. They thought long and hard for many years. Finally, they hit on a solution. The volcano would grow ever steeper and harder to, to climb. Heavy clouds would cover it, warning off those who tried to ascend. And heavy rains and even lightning could be called down to dissuade the most resolute. As a last resort, when someone not meant to enter the garden threatened to, the volcano would erupt. But every so often, once in a great while, a select individual or two would be allowed to enter the garden and see its flowers and trees and breathe the scented air and freighted mist. And these people would live forever. They would pass unhindered between the realms of the living and the dead. By the time I finished, we were sitting on a beach down the coast, drinking beers. 
The sun and light had disappeared from the sky and the heavens had grown a ghastly gray. With a certain comic symmetry, we had passed Hugo on our drive down, walking the other way on the same road, plodding along in flip-flops like a lost, friendless giant in the evening. Celeste was staring out at the charcoal blue water of the bay. What makes us special? Nobody knows, I said. Don't think it's because we're good or noble or purer or better. We got lucky. Not lucky, I said. There's a reason. We just can't know. Celeste made a face. I don't feel good. What's wrong? Isn't the beer helping? She looked at the can of beer in her hand as if it had materialized from nowhere. My throat hurts. I feel nauseous. Beer will help, I said, and drank some of mine to demonstrate. <laughs> I did not feel nauseous myself, but my throat had grown increasingly swollen and sore, and a pain which I imagined as a ball of pain had appeared in my abdomen. I told myself it was the ribs I had bruised earlier, or my anxiety, my fear. You feel fine, I told myself. You feel splendid. That's a funny word. I thought splendid. And in the instant of saying it, I did feel briefly good and even splendid. I finished my beer and rose to get more. Celeste moaned. I think I'm having an allergic reaction to that beach plum. <laughs> You're imagining it, I said. Wait here. <laughs> imagining it? Her voice was distant, drowned out in the surf that rolled in and crashed against the beach. To the west, a headland rose as no more than a dark shape against the still, faintly luminous sky. Remember, I said, you'll live forever. It's not a question of living, Celeste broke off. She made a gesture of inarticulacy that gave me the cover to say, two minutes, wait right here. At the beachside restaurant, I ordered another beer for myself and a pina colada for Celeste touching the part of my stomach that felt pregnant with a small, expanding pain, and watching the waves come in and catch the accumulated light of the cove in their churn. The ice juddered in the blender, and I thought of Hugo and wondered whether he always walked that same stretch of highway, like one of the unhappy souls who yearn to enter the secret garden, but are forbidden and pass forever beneath it in hopeless longing. It was possible the toxins from the death apple had a psychoactive element since it seemed somehow that my thoughts were not my own. They did not follow each other in the usual manner. My phone buzzed and I reached for it. How much I would miss the stars here, I thought, so vivid and white and numberless in the black, tearing up the night like a lace filigree. Jacqueline again. Do not look for my heart. The monsters have eaten it. <laughs> Something was really wrong. I wasn't that drunk. Truthfully, I was only buzzed. I shut my eyes and opened them again, but the words hadn't changed. Maybe I tried to reason heart was the heat and monsters was messieurs, but that didn't make much sense either. <laughs> when I returned with the drinks, I found Celeste lying on her side in the sand with her knees drawn up. Darling, are you dead? <laughs> she, sat, she, sat up very she sat up so fast I thought I must have scared her. There were tears in her eyes. Why did you do it, she said. Do what? She drank impatiently from the pina colada I offered her. Why did you make us climb that volcano? It wasn't what I was expecting, and it took me a moment to get my bearings. I didn't know why. It seemed for an instant that I would have to explain how a person comes to be this way or that, how the sun falls some afternoons, how certain fruits smell, the quality of light in one's eyes on a beach, and the figures who appear in the distance or sometimes nearer to confront us with their alien reality, grotesque angels making us curse the places where our bodies begin and end. But that was to answer a question she hadn't asked, I realized. Celeste drank more of her pina colada. There are certain things we have to do, I said, in order not to die of regret. If we can't make ourselves do them, someone else has to. And if we don't, we'll awaken on the day our heart fails and realize we stopped losing it long before it deserted us. That's stupid. Celeste gazed at the dark sea like there was something out there for her. And climbing the volcano was one of those? I don't know. Oh God, she said, we're not free. Free? It was my turn to ask her what she meant. Celeste hiccuped or burped and it turned into a small wretch, but nothing came up. She retched once more. Everyone wants to be beautiful, she said. Everyone envies and desires the beautiful, but we know beauty is a trap, a prison. We pretend beauty gives us power when it only makes us slaves to beauty's recognition. 
We grow to need the reflected light of this judgment to confirm who we are, and we wait, timid, even paralyzed, not wanting to imperil the verdict before it comes. There will be no greater day in my life than when my beauty fades, she explained. Oh, I will hate the day, rue it. I will do everything to forestall it, but on the day it comes, I will at last be free, free of the fear that I am not beautiful. Do you understand? It is the same with you and with everyone, except we do not mean beauty, do we? Beauty is only a metaphor in a bad poem. We were quiet a minute. Do not look for my heart. The monsters have eaten it. <laughs> Celeste smiled. Baudelaire. That's Baudelaire? La Fleur du Mal. Huh. I thought I should see something more in the words now that derangement should morph into wisdom. But all I could think about was Celeste's Fleur du Mal t-shirt and what Baudelaire would think about being on a t-shirt if he knew. <laughs> I loved everything very much in that instant, poetry and death, and the man with the missing leg, and the night, and the surf, and all the quiet leaves on the island that fluttered in secret breezes. And for a fleeting second I saw the way you sometimes catch a glimpse of an elusive logic you have not yet wrestled into captivity, what Celeste meant, and how the enemy of all the things I loved, all the lovable things, was all of us in our fear. Fire was falling from the sky. It came from such an unexpected place and with such sudden brightness that for an instant I thought the volcano was erupting. I thought some uninvited soul was trying to get into the garden and breathe the flowers of life or of death. And the souls guarding it had had to employ the last resort, which was to erupt the volcano, because the forces that could not be allowed to enter were getting close. For a second I even thought we were the ones who should not have been admitted, Celeste and I. In realizing their mistake, the guardians were now prepared to destroy the island rather than let us leave. But the volcano was not erupting. There was no noise, no trembling. Balls of fire, small lit globes were dropping from the sky. A meteor shower. They drew brief lines of evaporating luminance across inches of the sky. The balls looked like, burning globe, like the burning globes of pain in my abdomen, although smaller owing to the distance. And as I watched, Celeste began to vomit. First some wretches and dry heaves, then it all came up. Pina colada, beer, death apple, everything we had eaten that day. The meteors fell and she vomited. Over and over this continued. I wanted to tell her to look, but it was good she was vomiting, and I didn't want to interrupt it until she had gotten everything out. I looked around for others to confirm for me with their eyes to the heavens that this was happening. We were witnessing a miracle, but I was all alone. For a moment, I thought I saw Hugo standing back in the shadows of the trees watching, but of course this was only my wish, my projection, and I turned back to those mysterious bodies who had traveled so far for so long to die in splendor before us. A coda. Celeste vomited all night. At points I grew worried, but I knew it was her body protecting itself in the inner flame of life it held. Celeste must have figured out about the death apple at some point. She is a tenacious researcher of symptoms and maladies online. But we never spoke about it, and I never threw up myself. So in some sense, the apple is still inside me. But maybe this is a fanciful way of looking at things. I have not died yet, at any rate. And to judge by this unbroken streak of not dying, I will live forever. But this is fanciful, too. And so is the image I had of Jacqueline sitting up that night while Celeste vomited kept awake by the noise and her own worries about what I did not know, writing her poems at a small table that looked out at a sea lost to darkness, horrid poems about waves and sunsets and expressive hands, horrid and almost heartbreaking poems that stood like placeholders before everything they meant to be, while I dozed below and Celeste threw up again and again, and Hugo lay awake in his child's bed, giant Hugo, staring at the ceiling and dreaming of gardens and fury and freedom. Thank you.